Welcome to episode 31 of Radio 815, the podcast dedicated to examining the career of writer-director J.J. Abrams. I'm your host for this week. My name is Marcelo Nostroza, joined as always by my fellow co-host Matt Crandall. And on this edition of the show, we'll be talking about Lost, season one, episodes 12 through 14. So with all that pomp and circumstance out of the way, Matt, what did you think of whatever the case may be? So I liked this episode quite a bit. It is a Kate flashback episode. So now we are starting to get... Last week we had a, a the second Jack flashback episode. Now we're getting the second Kate episode. So they're really starting to focus on the main characters a lot more. And we're getting an idea of there are still some secondary characters that haven't gotten their own episode. But to, to flesh out the core group first really endears them more to us. And this, of course, whatever the case may be, being kind of a pun, because the main drama on the island is about a mysterious case that Kate and Sawyer stumble upon while having a erotic swim. And also the flashbacks are about a heist and Kate's criminal past and what may be in this case comes into play. I did really like how this episode starts where Sawyer and Kate are kind of cutting loose and going for this swim and it's a relaxing, peaceful moment that turns horrifying when they find two bodies decaying underneath them in the water, but also this mysterious case that then the whole time we're wondering what's going on with this. Um, so I like the intrigue that they set up in this episode. At the start of this episode, I just had one thought in my mind, and that thought is, um, Evangeline Lilly is really awesome at climbing trees. <laughs> um, I just, I just love, like you said, Matt, the the um, the playful, the the playful banter, the playful banter in this episode to start it off, and then once they find that spring or that lake or whatever the hell it is. And they actually swim down and they find the two bodies from uh, down in the river. It, it is really shocking. Lost does a really good job of showing you moments of peace and fun, but then undercutting it with moments of sure terror. Mm -hmm. the, the only thing that I didn't understand when I first watched it is if this case was so important to Kate why did she play coy with Sawyer the first time uh, uh, they found it together? I mean, she could have just said, listen, this case is mine and just take it. But, but, you know, she says this case is mine. And then when they come back up from retrieving it from under the water, she says, oh, this case is not mine. And, and, and then she goes all nuts, right? <laughs> she, she, yeah. she, she goes all weepy. I, I, I really didn't understand that, the, didn't vibe with that the first time I saw this episode. But uh, when I rewatched it for this podcast, I was like, you know what? The writers had to do that to sort of to sort of build up tension for Kate's um, Kate's uh, backstory in this episode. Also, I really like flashbacks in this episode with Kate pretending to be a photographer um, overseas taking pictures. I thought that was really cool. And I also like the fact that even though Kate set up this entire bank heist, she didn't tell the, the people that she was working with what she was really after. I mean, the, right. the, the people that she was working with thought that she was after, um, m uh, money, but in fact, she was after a specific, uh, a, a specific lockbox in the safe you know, with the mysterious number 815. So I thought that was funny. I really enjoyed this episode for the most part. Also, I really enjoyed this subplot of Saeed and Shannon getting together. Because for the most part, so far, Shannon has been, uh, and you can tell me if you disagree with me, Matt, on this point, but Shannon has been a piece of eye candy, basically. And it was really nice to, to see her be put to use in a different way, other than eye candy. Yeah, they finally added some much-needed depth to Shannon's character. And 
you know, I think that was intentional in this episode because they start to ramp up the next episode. We get even more, but it definitely was nice because she hasn't had much to do. And all these other characters have sort of been starting to come into play, but Shannon has still been sitting on the sidelines. So I did like her and Saeed trying to, you know, decode this French and, and giving some more layers to her and not just having her be the girl who's trying to get a tan. Um, and the fact that Saeed is starting to like her, you know, they're, they're sprinkling a few breadcrumbs of intrigue around um, to your point about Kate lying about the case. I think part of it is her history. She has had to be so deceitful that it's one of those things where even in a moment where she should be honest, she still doesn't know how to be. Even when her and Jack dig up the body of the marshal to get the key out of his wallet, when she has already said, I need to unlock this case, there are guns in it, Jack's on board with this, everybody's cool with it, she still feels the need to pretend that the key is not there. And, you know, Jack said... Yeah, that would that was a really good lift. You know, I almost would have fallen for it if I didn't know who I was talking to kind of thing. Um, and it's just because she's in this pattern from her everyday life before the island where she would just lie and probably not even know about it because she doesn't want to show her true self or admit that she needs help and all this kind of baggage that even though they're on the island and there is no reason to lie and you can be honest with these people, you have nowhere to go and nobody's really going to judge based on other factors. It's still a pattern and a habit that she can't break. You don't think they would judge her if like other people found out that she was the prisoner on the plane, that she was the one that the marshal was transporting? They would at first, partly the same way that you know, Sawyer has been so rude to Saeed, but I think that now they've been on the island long enough that people will have gotten used to her and sort of seen what she can do and how her and Jack are two of the people taking the reins that I think they could explain it away very easily that that nobody would really revolt on her. You know what I mean? So I feel like she has proven herself enough that. It wouldn't be a huge deal. But even in those moments where, you know, she she tries to hide that key from Jack, Jack, who does know everything about her, who knows why they're trying to open this case. So he thinks, you know, she could have just opened the case, grabbed that airplane and said, oh, like a little toy airplane. Oh, I'm just going to keep this. And like nobody would have thought twice about it. So it's just I think it's still that deep seated patterning and behavior that she's got to learn how to break. So you think that she's uh, uh, pathologically mistrustful of everyone because of what she uh, went through in her past? Yeah, for sure. I, I think that's kind of why they, they showed, like, even in these moments where there is no reason for her to lie, she's still kind of doing it. Um, but I did like when she does come clean, you know, about the airplane and who it belonged to. That was a nice moment because it is starting to break down these walls that she has put up. And Evangeline is great in that scene where, you know, she finally admits it belonged to the man I killed. Um, and so that, that was pretty powerful. And that does take, you know, at this point we aren't sure what Kate has done, you know, some thieving, some conning or whatever. But then she does say, you know, she killed someone. It adds an extra layer of, oh, okay. Maybe things got serious. But there's still deeper to that backstory that we have to figure out before we can jump to conclusions. I mean, you and me, and I'm sure a lot of people listening right now, know what she did. To be honest, she kind of had to, well, she didn't have to do it. She could have found another way to 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 solve her issues but but uh, to be honest she didn't really kill somebody in the right. general sense it's more her feeling like she killed someone but it's not it wasn't straight up murder or anything 
Right. Which would make her a harder character to connect with if it had been, if later we found out that it was straight up murder, then I think that that would have, the character would have taken a hit. If we would have found out that she would have committed straight up murder, I still would have found a way to like her because uh, if you guys were listening last week, you guys know that I love Canadians. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm more forgiving for, to, for, for, uh, I'm a little bit more forgiving to characters who uh, commit atrocities. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, with that being said, I'm sure like you said, Matt, there would have been a ton of people who watched the show from week to week that would have had a problem connecting, uh, with Kate because, because of the crime that she, uh, committed before we move on to the next episode, there is one more interesting thing that I thought, uh, sort of like an interesting wrinkle in this episode when Boone comes back from supposedly hunting boar. Uh, she sees um, Saeed, you know, sort of like, sort of like macking on Shannon, mm -hmm. right? And this he he gives he gives a look like, I'm gonna kill this guy. I'm thinking to myself, knowing what the story of uh, Shannon and Boone are, oh, dude, what are you doing? Are you are you jealous because she's not bothering you, or are you jealous because? She's with somebody else right now, and she's out of your hair. As we move on to the next episode, Hearts and Minds. So this one, I did enjoy that we finally got more of the Boone and Shannon backstory dynamic. Um, certainly, there are quite a lot of reveals that play on our assumptions. Um, so, you know, within this flashbacks, we find out Boone and Shannon are actually not blood related brother and sister. They are step brother and sister, which is an important distinction because that is part of the reason why Boone is acting uh, overly protective and confrontational with Saeed starting to show interest in Shannon. Um, it does show that, you know, in the flashbacks, Shannon asked for his help. And this whole scheme of whether she's being beaten or whether it's a con and all this stuff um, goes on that it kind of shows that Boone is in this pattern where he is like this lovesick puppy dog who will come running whenever Shannon wants him to. Um, and they reach a point, you know, where this pattern of him trying to swoop in and save her and please her. Um, and not getting anything in return kind of reaches its, you know, natural conclusion or whatever. And finally, the two of them do hook up and it's like one of those. OK, like this is an interesting wrinkle. Um, and then the morning after where it's like, you know, things are going back to the way they are like this never happened um, makes us feel bad for both of them, partly because. Obviously, Shannon is stuck in this kind of pattern where, you know, she deserves better and she could have better, but it's probably one of those self-sabotaging things where she doesn't think that she deserves love and that kind of thing. And of course, Boone, who has been devoted to Shannon, um, thinks that he is finally moving to the next step and then that all gets sort of swiped away. When it's like, no, like this was nothing. Um, so you feel bad for both of them in those fly in the flashbacks. Uh, and it's kind of, you know, heartbreaking and and sad. Like there's an, a level of sadness to both of them that didn't exist before this episode that now carries over. For some reason, the entire backstory between Boone and Shannon really didn't hit home with me when I was watching this episode, to be honest. but hearing you talk about it just now the way that you explained it just now made me interested in it a distinction i will make uh this like i hate to like rag on an episode this was probably my least favorite episode that we've watched so far so like i'm trying to dig into it to find the good stuff because it in terms of like the backstory it is kind of the least interesting and a little bit of this episode doesn't work but um you know, there was enough there, but go ahead, Marcelo. 
I, you know, you know, I mean, to be honest, uh, this was my least favorite episode, but I don't think that this, that this episode, when it comes to the flashbacks is the worst one The right. the, the, I mean, spoiler here, but you know, in the future, we find out a lot more about a character who is somewhere on the island and I couldn't give two sh- Well, that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. I care about, you know, that's not true. I will just say that this didn't really connect with me in the way that I wanted to, that it, I, that I wanted it to. Yeah. But with that being said, I, I thought there was an interesting, an interesting psychological point to Shannon um, in this episode because after they sleep together and we move to the next morning, Shannon really shows herself to be sort of controlling and sort of and sort of she seems to have Boone wrapped around her finger. So do you think yeah. right? So do you think that she needs that validation from Boone to 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 find some self worth within herself? I I think part of it is you know she. It's that classic, like, she finally realizes that this is somebody who cares a lot about her and she could be vulnerable with and could be loved. And instead of embracing that, you know, a lot of people, if that's the first time they're experiencing that kind of thing, push it away rather than try and bring it in because they, they're they afraid that they're unworthy or something. And I feel that's kind of what was going on there. So do you think that when Shannon called Boone the first time and basically was having a dis uh, 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 a uh, a domestic dispute with that idiot that she was dating do you think that she was in actual trouble at that point or or do you or, or do you think the the whole thing was a was a con you know just to get Boone's attention it's kind of up for debate still at this point because they they say like oh yeah like this was a con to do this thing but then you wonder was it all a con or was that moment actually genuine so it's still up for debate i think an interesting little wrinkle that i that i found in this episode when boone tries to get the um the police involved when he's at the police station and he's trying to you know uh implore the police to actually go and threaten this guy that shannon is dating uh right behind boone the 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 police officers bring in somebody quite interesting yeah, so I did love that Sawyer appears in one of the flashbacks um, getting arrested by the cops in Australia. So that was definitely a cool moment. And um, we find out more about that later. That's not the first time that during a flashback of a, spe- of a specific character, we see other characters from the island uh, sort of uh, in the background of their own flashbacks. Yeah, basically there was that Sun and Jin flashback that Jack was in and vice versa. So I do like when there's kind of those crossover moments. It adds a nice layer um, to the backstory. The thing that made me most invested in this episode was basically Boone's Crucible. When he finally admits to Locke that he thinks that he should tell Shannon what they're really doing out here because a lot of people who are on the beach are starting to suspect that um that that Locke and Boone are actually doing something else when they go out to hunt boar because they're not coming back with boar every day they're coming back with nothing right so um at that moment when when Boone says you know what I'm going to tell Shannon and then Locke basically says oh you know you should do what you what you think is right and then Locke, you know, pistol whips, basically pistol whips him with a, with the back of uh, the uh, the hunting knife that he has. That moment to me was like, what? What are you doing, John? Right. Have you have you gone off your rocker, or is this going to be one of your extreme lessons, so to speak? Yeah, and in that moment, it is one of those like, what the hell? Um, but we we're starting to get a sense of how important this hatch is going to be to John Locke. Um, and the quest to open it is going to be not as easy as they maybe thought initially. So I did like that. And of course, the fact that even Boone says, like, people are starting to notice that we are not hunting out here. Like, what are we going to do? And Locke's just like, 
you know, it is what it is. We just got to focus on figuring out how we're going to get into this thing. Um, so when he does smash him over the head, it caught me off guard and is one of those like, okay, what is up with John Locke? Can we trust him? And then, of course, the whole Boone and Shannon having this adventure on the island because they were both kidnapped by John Locke. At first, you're just like, what? <laughs> like, this is becoming a little much for Locke to go from nothing to Colonel Kurtz in like the course of uh, two minutes on the show. I was like, this is really weird. Like the first time you're watching it. Um, and then, of course, Shannon gets killed by the monster, which we still haven't seen. And the the death scene is fine. It's interesting, not as emotional as certainly it could have been, um, which is partly partly by design because then we find out Shannon is alive and well, hanging out with Saeed on the beach, and this is a a fever dream that Boone is basically having, brought on by um, whatever Locke did to him. So it's. I like, I like that, but I also, it was kind of a cheat. Um, and I, I know why they did this, you know, Shannon and Boone having this adventure together where they air a lot of their grievances and he realizes how important she is to him. Um, but I'm not like a huge fan of episodes in general that end up being, a dream or a hallucination or some sort of thing where it turns out all the things that we thought were important don't actually carry any weight. The one thing, the one thing about that whole Shannon and Boone adventure is what after Boone finds out that it was all basically just a hallucination and Locke says, how did you feel when she died? And he says, Mm -hmm. he says relieved. I, I found that to be shocking and I was like, okay, all the time you've been looking after what we thought was your sister, and we find out that you're relieved now that you thought she had died. I was yeah. like, I found that to be really, really shocking. And it was, it was, it was sort of a peek into uh, um, Boone's soul, so to speak. Yeah, big time. And I think it shows that you know this whole back and forth with them and him always coming to the rescue is exhausting. So even if he does love her or certainly at one point he did, um, it it's weird. I think it even surprises him that relief is what he felt in those moments rather than any sort of overwhelming sadness. It felt like a little bit of a weight had been lifted, which is one of those nice, swerves that actually made the episode a little bit more interesting than it was on the surface. Um, so I think that that was, you know, a, a good call by the writers, especially for an episode that I didn't love that adds a nice, Oh, uh, kind of moment to the end there. One hilarious moment in this episode where I just lost it is when, uh, uh, uh Hurley comes to Jack complaining of, of some, uh, intestinal, <laughs> uh, distress and he go and and you know jack goes what have you been eating and hurley goes oh i've been eating you know fish you know i was eating boar but there's no more of that and you know i can't i i, I really can't you know catch my own fish and this guy Jin, you know ever since i refused to eat the fish that he offered me um i haven't been able to get my hands on fish and when hurley confronts Jin, he steps on a sea urchin uh uh-huh. <laughs> And then he just proceeds to lose it, and he goes, "Pee on my foot! Pee on my foot! You have to pee on it." Yeah. So I, I, I just, I just really found that moment to be funny and really heartwarming, and it also, it, it also really does something interesting for Jin, even though the, even though he has a hard time communicating with everyone, um, sometimes a language barrier can't stop you from being kind to somebody else. Right. So I, you know, you know, I, I just found it really interesting that at the end of the episode, after everything that Jin and Hurley went through in that brief moment there, uh, for Jin to, I mean, for Jin to uh, bring Hurley back a, a clean fish already. 
Yeah, that was nice, and especially they haven't given Jin yet a lot of moments to to be nice. So that was that was good because at first it was like, oh man, like he's angry again about something. Like this is getting to be a pattern for this guy. So I like that he showed kindness in that moment. Um, and of course, when Hurley is listing off all the stuff he's eating as he's grabbing those those large leaves. And Jack's like, tell me you're not eating those. And he said, no, dude, these are not for eating. Uh, was another great Hurley moment. So also the big revelation that we get in this episode, when we find out that Sun is basically making a garden. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, you know, uh, in one scene, Kate is basically talking to Sun, not, know, you know, you know, not knowing that Sun can perfectly understand what she's saying. And she says something. And then Sun just moves her head and looks at Kate, and Kate goes, "Wait a minute, you can understand me? You can you speak English? Mm-hmm. You know?" And then we, you know, and then we get into the whole thing about how uh, Sun doesn't want Jin to know that she speaks English, which in it, which in itself is a really interesting uh, is a really interesting problem to have because I would believe that. If you're in a situation like this, you you would want to be honest with your with your spouse. So to me, it I I really didn't understand why Sun wanted to hide this from Jin. Wouldn't it wouldn't it wouldn't it have just been better for her to come out with it? Or or or, or what do you think to that aspect? Well, I still think it's like a a bigger. It would be nice if she would just come out with it, but I can understand why they haven't gone that route because it is going to be like a dramatic moment. Um, So I understand why it's still being hidden, but you know, for the sake of the audience, it would be nice to just get it out of the way. Early on in the episode, we noticed that the, that the tide is moving in rather quickly and it, and it is It's destroying everything on the beach. So, uh, so Saeed, Jack and a bunch of others decide to take a bunch of their stuff and move it further up the beach. But, when Rose is is taking back her luggage and Bernard's luggage, um, she notices Charlie just sitting there on the beach, um, not doing anything because he's 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 reportedly still in shock over what happened to Claire. And I found it really interesting that Charlie, of all people, would open up to one of the one of the plane members that we know the least uh, to this point, mm-hmm. you know. And I really found it touching and really and sad that Charlie, towards the end of the episode, uh, sort of breaks down to Claire and he says, "Help me," and he just starts. He loses it. I I, I found that moment to be profound, and I found it to be some brilliant act, uh, some brilliant acting by uh, Derek Monaghan. It was definitely a really nice moment uh, for that character in an episode that he's not the star of, right? So, so that was very good. The final episode that we're going to talk about today is episode 14, entitled Special. So this is the Michael and Walt flashback episode. Um, And I've got mixed feelings on it, to be honest with you. I like sort of the the flashbacks um, where we see Michael and Walt being estranged, Michael not being part of Walt's life, and then the incident where you know he he has to sort of confront the fact that he hasn't been a father when susan dies and brian walt's stepdad doesn't want anything to do with walt now that he's not tied to walt's mom um which is like a heartbreaking thing where we find out like you know how could you raise a kid for that many years and just be like, get this guy out of my life. I don't want to see him again. Um, But it is because Brian thinks that Walt is weird. Uh, And we see some of that weirdness start to rear its head in this episode where, you know, Walt is reading about the birds and then a bird kills itself on the window. Um, They, the, the way that the stuff on the Island works where Walt was reading a comic book about a polar bear and then there's a giant polar bear attack um, starts to bring up some questions about what is going on with Walt and this island. Um, I thought that for the most part, 
in the island stuff, Michael has not been that sympathetic a character, partly because he's either defending himself against Jin or getting mad at Locke. And this goes a little bit deeper into why he's so mad at Locke for just being nice to Walt. Um, when you watch it now, you know, immediately you start to think like, okay, maybe he thinks Locke's a, a pervert or something. But uh, 15 years ago when this aired, I don't think that's immediately where people would jump. But so they they paint it as, you know, Michael had to take a back seat to this guy, Brian, for so long in Walt's life that now anybody kind of stepping into that father figure territory is immediately seen as a threat or competition. And because Michael is desperate to try and get this relationship with his son on firmer ground and less shaky footing, like I understand it, but because Walt likes Locke and Locke treats Walt kind of, you know, nicer than anybody else is. It's very frustrating to see these moments where Michael is acting like such a dick. Um, but they make sense when you see the flashbacks and that most powerful part of the flashbacks is when Michael gets that box of all of the letters he has written to Walt that were never given to him, which is, um, a great scene for two reasons. One, uh, when he opens it, before we know what these are, uh, Harold Perrineau does a great job of sort of selling a lot of emotion and and baggage in his face alone without articulating what it is. Um, and then when we get the scene on the beach where he shares them with Walt and and tells him, like, look, you, I wasn't in your life for so many years, but it's not like I forgot about you. I thought that you were getting these and I, I did care about you. And that goes a long way to bridging the gap. It's pretty obvious to anybody who's watched the show when that scene where Michael is reading the letters and it's from a low angle and they show that roof in that house in Australia that is basically a variant of the Dharma logo, yep. um, which was a nice kind of like foreshadowing of, of things to come. Uh, on a rewatch, you know, the first time I would, wouldn't have thought twice about it. I would have just thought, oh, they're going super low angle, which is weird. But in watching it again, you're like, oh, look at that. So that was kind of cool. Also, also, did you notice in one of the one of the birthday cards that uh, um, Michael draws for Walt? He draws the polar bear that was that they uh, that they shot on the island. Right. To be honest with you, this episode kind of pissed me off. In, in, you know, in that I, like I, like I said previously in this podcast, I hate when adults run away from responsibility, mm -hmm. um, because in a sense, that's what kind of happened to me when my, when my biological mother didn't want to take care of me, you know, yeah. she, she sort of just, she just sort of put me in the responsible hands of my grandparents who raised me you know to her credit she did she i mean i don't i don't blame her what for what she did but i always wondered to myself what my life would have been if she would have said no i'm 19 years old but i'm still going to take care of this disabled kid you know yeah. I, I i probably wouldn't be here right now talking to you about about loss i would probably be God knows where, or I might be dead. Who knows? When we see uh, Walt's stepfather say to Michael, "Listen, I signed on because I love you." I am. Um, I can't remember Walt's mother's name. If you could help me out, Susan. Yeah, I. I you know, I saw. You know, I signed up for Susan. I didn't sign up for Walt. That that scene to me was really heartbreaking, yeah. and and really disturbing, but. Um, I also had a I also had a, a big problem with Susan in this episode because because uh, when when we first meet her in the flashbacks, we you know they're they're all you know lovey dovey and 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 they're looking at cribs to mm -hmm. you know to buy for Walt, but then it was like, dude, you you had this great guy over here 
that is a dreamer and he's a painter and he's going to start working in construction. But, you know, then you turn halfway around and start dating this other a-hole from your from your law practice. What kind of what are are you are you a faithful partner or what? <laughs> what what type of bullshit is this? Uh, yeah. I like <laughs> I hate people who are disloyal in relationships. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I've, I, you know, I've told you, Matt, privately, I think, um, you can stop me if I'm wrong. I've told you that if I'm ever in a relationship with somebody, I'm not going to go swimming, you know, right. and I'm not, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to two time that person with somebody else. I, I hate this loyalty. And, and that's what bothered me the most about this episode. But with that being said, I really loved that when she knew that she was going to die, that she, that she had enough foresight to leave, uh, Walt, uh, to leave, uh, Walt with Michael. I thought that was a really nice touch. That was a way for her to say to Michael, listen, after all we've been through, I know I screwed up and I'm sorry. Well, I don't think that she did. It's different. I think Brian okay. just didn't, didn't want him. So Brian's lying. Brian is saying, you know, oh, she wanted you to have him just cause he doesn't like Walt and he doesn't want to deal with him. That's what I took from it. That's part of why that, like, uh, you know, Michael kind of knows that Brian is lying. So then Michael has no problem in lying to Walt saying, oh, Brian said you could have uh, the dog, which which is like his payback for being like, you know, I I know that Susan didn't want me to have Walt. I know that you are just the the guy who who can't handle him, um, which pisses Michael off because he doesn't believe that otherwise she would have reached out to him when she was dying rather than wait until after she was gone. I feel, Mm -hmm. but, but that's just me maybe reading it different. And I think both are valid, but that's just what I, what I seem to gravitate towards the more cynical approach. Why do you think that uh, she believed that Michael wasn't capable of taking care of Walt. Do you, do you think it was just because, you know, she just saw his lifestyle and she couldn't imagine him raising a child by himself on a, on a, you know, on a artist's salary or something like that? Well, I, I do think also there's like a lot we don't know about their relationship. Mm-hmm. So it's easy for us to look at it and be like, oh my God, like it fell apart and it's all her fault. But like, we still don't know what kind of person was Michael within the relationship? So maybe he has demonstrated to her that stuff that we don't know where like he is not ready to take this responsibility and might not be fit to be a father at this point. Um, So we don't know if Susan is just being, you know, unreasonable or if she actually has reason to believe this. Because we don't know enough about their dynamic. Do you think it would have behooved the writers to show us a little bit more of their relationship? Because to me, it it felt that the writers wanted for us to go against Susan in this episode and to fall on the side of Michael in this episode. Right. They, they do want us to do that. Um, And I, like I, like I said, I just don't know if that is them because the show is about Michael and not Susan. Um, it's just easier to make her the villain of the situation. Mm -hmm. And also I think maybe they had other intentions later where we would find out a lot more, but one of the things that frustrates me about lost in general, I feel like the Michael and Walt dynamic and storylines never paid off in a way that they sort of set them up to. Um, and I, I don't know if that's partly because they end up eventually exiting these characters maybe sooner than they thought. Um, but in general, like it's one of those things I'm still unsure of whether Michael was done wrong by, or if there was actually like a reason for him to be done wrong by. I really love that you brought that up because that's what I was going to go to next. So do you believe that the writers had a bigger plan for Walt ultimately because, because of the fact that the, the, the actor who played Walt kept growing up and they couldn't justify him growing up so much from season to season, they had to write him out of the show. 
what do you think they were planning with Walt? I don't know what they were planning, but I, I have always felt that what we got was not what they were setting up, especially like in an episode like this, where they really are trying to show us that Walt is special in some way. And yeah, they, they bring that back around a bit with, with where it goes, but not in a satisfying, like, Oh, of course, that's why he has these powers kind of way. And I think it is part of the thing is that, yeah, they realized that the kid was growing up too fast. Um, and that, you know, maybe just this whole Michael and Walt thing wasn't playing as well as they thought it would. Um, cause you know, remember even like they write off both of them, but then they do bring back Michael for a little bit. So then it's like, okay, maybe they felt that they had kind of wronged the guy because they, they got rid of him too soon, but then, you know, never really righted the ship with that Michael and Walt stuff. So it's a real tough call. And without being there in the moment, it's tough to say, but I feel like they place a lot more emphasis on this story now than they ever do again, other than just the, the whole, you know, the others coming for Walt, but still, even then, like, it's not clear why, it's not as clear why as I would like. Do you think it would have been better for them to cast uh, 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 a older actor as Walt, let's say like a teenager, instead of a instead of a ten year old? You know what? I I don't know that it would have made that much of a difference. Part of it is just you can you never know how someone's going to grow up. If you look at some TV shows, like. You know, I'll just give a, a crappy example, but um, one of my like favorite comedies right now is The Goldbergs. And the kid who plays Adam, when they started, was like 10. And the guy's like 17 now. Other than his voice having changed, the dude looks almost exactly the same. Um, but with Malcolm David Kelly, overnight, the kid went from like young Walt to looking like a dude in his 20s. Because he shot up like super tall. Um, so some people just age different. You know, if it had been Frankie Muniz from Malcolm in the Middle, that guy looked the same forever. Even today you see him, he looks just like he did. Uh, so I think that they just, it's not that they got unlucky, but they cast a guy who, you know, it's the a dice roll. Whether it's going to be believable that it's still only six months later when the kid looks like he's aged about 15 years instead of three. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that was part of it, but also I feel like what they should have done is just ignored it. <laughs> if they had just had that guy still playing, you know, a little bit younger, but just explained it away with, Oh my God, the Island must have some sort of super puberty powers. Uh, we would have rolled with it. Especially at that time when, when, you know, if you were watching Lost when, when it was airing, you really didn't know what the hell the island was. So the island, you know, messes up with, with, with proper, you know, north, south, and west. It, it doesn't quantify. It's like, it's like the island is, is in a, it, it's in a time bubble, so to speak. When Michael sort of confronts Locke about teaching Walt had to throw knives and he takes him away from Locke and, and Boone now, for some reason, who is like Locke's guard dog. I found that to be stupid and <laughs> unnecessary. Yeah. Uh, a little later on, we find out that Michael is building, that Michael is doing something with these long bamboo sticks. Right. And in that scene, I was like, dude, okay, so it was Michael's idea to do this. I thought it was Jin's idea to do this. Because if you if you guys remember, there was this episode early on where in the background we see Jin collecting bamboo sticks. Mm -hmm. So do you think that Jin made a deal with Michael to to help him with this little project? Or did that come later once Jin finds out something about his wife that we'll discuss at a later date? Uh, I don't know. Like, I, it could just be one of those things where maybe it was Michael and Jin saw 
like started collecting this stuff for other reasons and then decides that, you know, this raft is a good idea. Um, at this point, it's still not super clear, but it is definitely interesting um, because, yeah, there is other uses for bamboo, but was that what Jin was doing in the last episode or was it um, for this raft? I just thought that that, that 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 was interesting. Like, you know, early on, you know, we would see, you know, certain characters having a conversation and then we would yep. see G then, then we would see uh, Jin, you know, carrying these giant bamboo sticks off into the jungle doing God knows what at the time when you were first watching lost, what did you think was on, you know, in the hole in the ground, basically? What, what, what did you think was down there? I had no idea. I had no idea. Um, so certainly, especially at this point, I didn't have any clue. And I didn't ever think that it would be what it was. I thought maybe it would be some sort of like storage container um, with some sort of supplies or something. Like, uh, you know, in case anybody ever returned to this island, there would be a, a cache of survival tools and that kind of thing. But that's kind of as far as I ever thought it would be. So, of course, when we find out in season two what's actually in there, um, it caught me off guard for sure. Yeah, but a storage container without any handles on the outside to open it? Well, yeah. Then I also, you also wonder, like, was there some sort of, you know, horrible experiment that went wrong and this is to keep the radiation inside, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what did what did you think? Uh, I had, uh, to, to be honest, I had no idea. Like, I'm not, generally, I'm not a person that likes to speculate too much. Mm -hmm. I just, I just like to let the writers take me on the journey that they want to take me on. But Lost was that, Lost and 24 was the first shows that really got me interested in, in sort of, in sort of, you know, speculating to the point where I got a headache. Thinking about right. thinking about Lost, specifically thinking about what a specific character does who will meet at some point. One weekend when my grandfather, when, when me and my grandfather were going on a road trip, and I basically spun this entire theory about Lost, about how the island moves about time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, well, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, I will address that when we actually get to that point, because that's far in the future uh, that'll do it for this edition of radio 815 uh before we go here if you guys like uh what we do here at all if you have any questions for us you can send us questions or comments or whatever on twitter uh hash at, at hashtag radio 815 but matt if the good folks want to reach you uh what would be the best place for them to do so on twitter at matt crandall if you guys want to reach me, you can also reach me on Twitter. I'm at CreekFanatic88, but thank you so much for listening. Uh, we really appreciate it, and it means so much to us. But with that being said and done and out of the way, as always, until next time, we'll talk back soon. <laughs>